Welcome back to the uh, panel discussion following these four inspiring uh, presentations. Uh, for this uh, panel discussion, in addition to the distinguished speakers we've had, we're also very happy uh, to see um, Professors uh, Jim Allison and Pam Sharma join us from MD Anderson. Uh, welcome very much to both of you. Thanks for joining. Um, before we uh, enter the discussion, I I would like to ask each of the uh, speakers to sort of do a 60 second um, summary uh, elevator pitch. What gets you excited about gamma delta T cell biology and its clinical use? And, and you know, please use your own words as an example. Um, and we'll just go in order of uh, presentation. So uh, may I ask uh, Daniel to uh, start with, uh, with his elevator pitch? Yeah, thanks, Andrea. So uh, in 60 seconds, uh, so uh, I try to say what's uh, more exciting uh, is uh, for years uh, work on the plating using gamma or data to only talk about this uh, activation. I think for the first time I'm convinced that we can really activate them and that it's safe. Uh, because for me, some, something that was a question and the second thing uh, what I'm excited about and have questions is the reason why uh, we have seen some clinical responses uh, together in patient refractory 20 pd one plus uh, CTA4 uh, in the novel combination. And uh, I'm really willing to get uh, what will be the transactional data from patients to try to understand what is ongoing. So I'm really excited by these two things. Just uh, one. Awesome. Oh, no, thank you. Uh, Jürgen? Yeah, so um, I mean, excitement has already a lot of shared, but I think the, the key for success for gamma delta T cell inspired therapies is really understanding the molecular mechanism. So that's why at least we are really diving into all the different modulations of the receptor and ligands. And I think uh, we, we are really are a far way down the street, but I think we're not yet there. Uh, and uh, you cannot underestimate the diversity in the tumor as well as in the gamma delta T cells uh, to really uh, be as e equally effective as, for example, checkpoint inhibitors. I think that's really key. But I, I think we, we are really getting there. We have a lot of tools now from single cell sequencing to receptor isolation, which will bring us there in the next years. Thanks very much, Jürgen. Um, Michael. So for me, what is exciting working on a cell type, which is, which is clearly different from B-Delta 2 to B-Delta 1, I think have a unique biology and, and they're also less well understood, I think, as the Delta 2 cells, because uh, we just didn't have the protocols and methods to isolate these cells and study them. And uh, I think the data that is coming in over the last couple of years that we're generating make me believe specifically for the, for the tissue resident cells that they bring properties that uh, that might be highly beneficial specifically to treat solid tumors, uh, make them highly applicable. And I think the more we understand about the biology and how we can modulate these cells, um, uh, I think these cells can really uh, have a fundamental impact specifically in cell therapy for solid tumors. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. And then uh, Hans? Uh, so I think there has been enormous progress in the field of cancer immunotherapy um, over the last years, but uh, still many patients do not experience long-term benefit from, from that. And uh, therefore there is a clear unmet medical need and in part novel approaches like CAR T cell approaches and, and bispecific antibodies um, uh, have, have shown efficacy, but also uh, limitations, uh, including safety limitations, um, and uh, complexities with manufacturing and, and preconditioning for car-based car approaches. But the gamma delta T cells, in my opinion, are uh, a very attractive uh, monomorphic homogeneous effector cell population with an important intrinsic ability to distinguish tumor cells from normal cells. And the early clinical trials um, have, have really demonstrated the safety and the potential of these uh, untargeted approaches. And I believe that the, the tumor targeted activation of gamma 9 delta 2 T cells um, with, uh, uh, I think, by specific approach would be very attractive, avoids the complexities of cell therapy, uh, has a relatively low risk of CRS, 
and uh, also avoids co-activation of suppressor T cell populations and could provide thereby a very robust anti-cancer platform uh, with the potential uh, high value in, in patients with many different cancer types. Thanks very much, Hans. <clears throat> I think uh, we all share uh, a lot of enthusiasm for this uh, this novel cell type. Or, uh, cell type is not novel. We heard it's 500 million years old, but uh, uh, at least the application of the cell type and its biology. I think what's interesting is that um, before um, alpha beta receptor T cells were actually used in the clinic, uh, there was already a lot of uh, at least um, more than um, superficial understanding of their biology. And, and I get the sense that we're still uh, working out what the mode of action is for each of these uh, sub, uh, you know, diverse gamma delta T cell types, although there's clearly a lot known too. Um, can I ask uh, Jim, uh, Jim, what is your, um, what gets you excited about this biology and what you've heard this morning? Yeah, I'm you, Jim. I think you just touched on it. Um, when we started working on gamma delta cells of mice in the mid 80s, you know, we were perplexed by the fact they didn't seem to be MHC restricted, and despite the fact that they had you know, multiple D elements and whatever in the delta change where they could make a huge amount of diversity, it just was not realized, at least in mice, where we would get the same sequence in the same tissue from mouse to mouse, strain to strain. And so that, that was very frustrating biology, which uh, anyway, it was frustrating enough, even though we could show that, that uh, gamma delta, B gamma threes in the mouse would recognize damaged keratinocytes. We could never figure out exactly what the biology of that the relevance was. Mm -hmm. and that's why I kind of left the field and started working on co-stimulation and left it to the late Wendy Haverin, who you know, carried on the gamma delta work. But I'm really pleased today to see, uh, and, and I, I think you're right, the, the secrets, there's still a lot of secrets there, but they're beginning to unravel. And it's time to really, you know, bring them to the forefront and examine how they can be used so in all the different forms we've heard about today. I think uh, uh, nobody's regretting the fact that you turned to co-stimulation in the past. So. But at the same time, it's also great to see uh, a lot of development in the Gamma Delta field. Um, um, maybe, uh, maybe I want to ask you, Pam, to respond. Um, maybe, maybe could you also comment a little bit on what you think the potential is in solid tumors uh, or the use to treat uh, epithelial cancers rather than just thinking about hematological tumors? Yeah, sure. So first, you know, obviously T-cell therapies are where we've seen the most anti-tumor responses in the clinic. Um, but a lot of these therapies, of course, have been focused on the alpha-beta T-cells. And I think we have this untapped potential where gamma-delta T-cells have not been studied in depth. And, you know, based on the biology of what we suspect and what you've heard today, you know, you expect that this should also have a very important role given the frequency of the cells that we find in the tumor microenvironment for solid tumors as well. Um, and the ability to also target tumor associated antigens um, on those solid tumors and thereby recruiting these types of cells into the tumor microenvironment to have their uh, best impact. So I think, you know, um, it's still early days, but it's definitely headed in the right direction. Um, and I think the clinical trials um, and hopefully the patient samples that are collected on the clinical trials will give us uh, sufficient information um, to design the next set of studies. Great, great. Um, maybe uh, ask the various panelists, what do you hold with this uh, potential in, uh, in, in epithelial solid cancer? So, so the use of your platforms beyond um, uh, I said beyond hematological cancers, where we know it's been a little bit uh, cumbersome yet to to try to engage uh, alpha beta T cells by T cell engagers, or, or even using CAR Ts for various reasons. And there's there's a lot of um, potentially associated talks. But what do you think makes the biggest difference that uh, for gamma delta T cells, whether delta ones or delta twos or other diverse uh, cell types? for us to hope that we can now crack open uh, you know, the use of cell therapy in, in solid tumors. Maybe I can start with, uh, with Michael. So for me, specifically engaging gamma delta T cells, you're, you're engaging a pure effector population, right? If you use an anti-CD3, you're engaging also and activating the cell types you're not you don't want to activate like T-Rex, for example. And I think 
that's the big benefit now with gamma delta T cells and then also the ability to really recruit and orchestrate uh, the adaptive immune system to bring in uh, and I think to do maybe generate a more permissive tumor microenvironment that then enables the adaptive um, immune system to kick in again. So I think that's that's the big benefit. Anyone else? Yeah, maybe commenting. So I, I may refer to the data we, we had generated with Hans Klevis, um, uh, or tumor organoids where Joel Sebastian and um, Florian Dickers really looked at the, at the different original tumor types. And of course, there you see a great potential in terms of great killing, but you see also great diversity. So, so I think we need to be aware that patient selection might also be key and better understanding which, which patients who will enter a clinical trial uh, will, will be also key to, to, to have a chance to get a positive signal. So Hans, uh, come up uh, mute. Hans, did you want to add something? Maybe. No, I, I fully agree with with uh, with with the remarks. Uh, and and perhaps to add, I think an important feature of of gamma nine delta two T cells, uh, or gamma delta T cells, uh, in, more generally, is their tumor preferential activity. Um, and I think that has been observed by by multiple uh, investigators, and uh, the safety has been confirmed in multiple studies. Uh, so I think that that may uh, allow for a larger therapeutic window, which could be very important um, uh, to this, uh, as opposed to the, uh, the the limitations that have been observed uh, with CD3 T cell engagers that really have a small therapeutic window, at least for solid uh, for solid tumors. Da Daniel, do you agree with the safety window? Uh, do we see evidence of that now? Well, yes, is what I, I tried to to summarize in in my sixty seconds. Uh, so uh, the, the only the only thing I, I would add, uh, so in metallurgical malignancies is rather obvious. Uh, it's something I'm working on for years. So it's rather obvious for delta two and delta one, and maybe delta three and others. So it's rather obvious. Solid tumors um, in general in vitro it works. Uh, in most of the solid tumors we have tested with the activating the free antibody works. PDX in mice as well. Uh, the, the only concern I had initially was to be convinced that they could go into uh, the tumor's bed. So from what, what I've seen from our work on eviction and what uh, Ant presented, it seems that the cells, once activated, are moving from the, the, the blood to the tissue and from translational study presented at the SITC on the eviction, they are moving to the tumor bed as well. And the second thing that was, this is surprising for me, I think it makes sense based on what Anne said as well, is that you have at the same time a, a recruitment of CD8 cells in any case, which for me was unexpected from what I, I because it was a guess, but it was expected. So I think is is going in a good direction for Delta two. Maybe for Delta one, we'll see. Um, we we'll have to keep this in mind. Fair enough. Maybe may, can I ask you, Pam, um, from your clinical point of view, where should we go with this? These platforms. Where do you think is medical need? Where do we see potential evidence of, uh, of utility and? And what would you like to read out when you mentioned uh, we need to get to clinical samples and biomarkers? What is it that you're really keen on reading out? So, I mean, just based on what we've seen on, you know, in immune checkpoint therapy, where you can clearly compare responders and non-responders, um, you know, it's very important to see an increase in the T-cell infiltration, not just, you know, hopefully just the gamma delta, but you should recruit alpha beta T-cells as well, as you were showing in some of the talks. Um, and you should see a good interferon gamma signature. It seems to go along with an anti-tumor response. So I think these are the things you would look for, you know, initially on biomarkers. You may identify other things. And now that we have single cell RNA sequencing and CYTOF and codex, I'm sure we'll get even better at understanding some of these um, uh, biomarkers in human tumors. And in terms of, you know, um, where do we go with the therapy? I mean, there's a lot of unmet need. I mean, I wish I could say we were curing 100% of patients who are not. Um, and, you know, obviously the, the data that we saw 
presented in patients who received ipilimumab and nivolumab and were refractory and didn't respond to that treatment and then responded to, um, you know, therapies uh, with uh, gamma delta T cells is very important. I think it gives us a, a really um, big um, place where we can think of the therapy because resistance to immune checkpoint therapy uh, could be what we use as, you know, the, the types of patients you want to enroll. Um, and if you can have a signal there, I think that's a very important signal for moving forward, um, you know, towards approvals. Thanks very much. Um, Jim, if you um, think about this uh, and then potentially co combining uh, gamma delta T cell activators or, or cell therapy with checkpoint inhibitors or other uh, cancer therapies, what are your thoughts? What should we be looking for? And, and how do you see the potential of the combination? Well, the thing that I've um, seen today that gives me a, a lot of hope is, is what was mentioned, you know, this almost NK cell-like ability of the gamma delta cells to, you know, not just react to a specific target, but some way of recognizing that it's a cancer cell. And I think we'll, we'll work that out one day, but the window is, gives you some advantages over alpha beta T cells. On the other hand, if you can kill them, I'm quite sure with the gamma delta cells, I'm quite sure that using things like NIC delay 4 you can, uh, since it works during priming, really expand the alpha beta cells to come in and mount that response to the neoantigens that are sp specific for that for that tumor cell and, and give you a multi-targeted, you know, multivalent targeted approach. So there's a lot of potential there. Yeah. And, and you're thinking about uh, also the indications that are currently, uh, let's say, not responsive necessarily right. to check one inhibition like... Well, we talked about a couple that we talked about prostate, colorectal, um, you know, some of the bigger indications that we see, you know, just, just too little uh, activity. Do you, do you yeah, think pancreatic? I mean, I mean, well, there's some, there's a great uh, concentration, I think, of people thinking that only uh, tumors that have hundreds of, of mutations and uh, consequent multiplicity of a target, you know, possible targets will respond. And yet, um, with with uh, some work from uh, Pam's group has shown that uh, even prostate patients that have only ten express mutations, two or three of them could be picked out, um, you know, by alpha beta cells when you gave NIC to like four. So I think it's going to add a whole new dimension to yeah. prostate specifically, and perhaps even to pancreatic and and um, and um, glioblastoma, which are yeah. down there just about as cold as prostate. Yeah, I think um, we've seen uh, uh, clear evidence in various non-clinical models, whether ex vivo patient materials or even in vivo studies, that there is a potential for single agent activity as well as combination activity. And we'd all love to see that translated into clinical reality. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy to see that um, a lot of these approaches are now in the clinic and are starting to produce data. Um, any, any, um, any response to this, uh, Daniel, for instance, on, on uh, the potential for combination? I know you're thinking about combination studies or already progressing those. Oh, basically, what, what I showed. So uh, our way is rather straightforward because uh, you need, first need to go uh, on a patient that are refractory. Uh, and it's what we are doing currently with uh, a patient with uh, TPD-1. Uh, then after this, we have to consider other strategies. And uh, on our side, we will we'll try IL-2, so which will be one of the next step for IMCHEC that uh, Paul Frona will present soon in 2022. Uh, so because we are dealing mainly with cells that are innate cells that have a poor capacity uh, to proliferate. And I will want to have something that is one shot or more. Uh, it's, it's a question that is open. So from beginning when the company was launched, the, the goal was to have PT1 first and to see whether we needed to have uh, as well something that was acting by the, the cells per se, moving to the, the tumor and or proliferated, uh, which is a concern of people doing cell therapy. Uh, I know that uh, Larry Lamb or, or Richard Lopez are working on this as well and other people on the data too. 
So we, which is one of our concerns. I hope I've, I've, um, I've answered your question, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, absolutely. Um, can I turn to another question that came up when we were preparing for this symposium? And, and, and maybe this is more uh, relevant for the cell therapies and the, um, and, and the engagers. But do you think uh, that we can broaden the target space uh, for tumor-specific targeting of our uh, gamma delta cells um, because of maybe there is seems to be a hint of enhanced safety uh, versus efficacy window? And, and what does that tell us about where, where we should go? So Hans, you saw, show, showed us data for EGFR, which is a target that is great for antibodies, but has not been sort of tangible uh, for uh, for cell therapies or, or even T-cell engagers uh, for, for various reasons. Um, do, do you guys see uh, an opening to revisit these these well-described targets from the past and, and now maybe try to target those with delta cells, gamma delta cells? Um, yeah, definitely. So, so we have uh, worked for quite a bit of time on, on EGFR gamma delta engagers. Um, and um, we have consistently seen that these um, engagers trigger gamma delta T cell activity against tumor cells expressing EGFR uh, and while sparing uh, healthy tissue expressing EGFR, including keratinocytes, uh, normal colon tissue, uh, liver tissue, peritoneum tissue. And, um, and to further um, illustrate that is, I think, a very important uh, uh, observations that we made in the non-human primate studies that I also uh, demonstrated in, in the presentation where we could dose um, up to very high levels of the engager uh, without seeing any, any uh, safety concern. Uh, and, and that was in very sharp contrast to what has been noted with the CD3 engagers targeting EGFR, that at very low doses uh, were fatal within, within a few days. Um, so I think the unique properties of the gamma delta T cell population really allow um, targeting uh, uh, tumor associated antigens that are, are more widespread um, than uh, and extend thereby also to, uh, to, to, to the treatment of uh, solid tumors. Jürgen and Michael, any response? What do you think of the revisiting the all the targets? Yeah, sort of. I'm, I'm wondering, may, maybe on top of this, uh, um, uh, sort of, wh why is the gamma delta as a carrier maybe safe? And I mean, what what we observe is that these, these are very vulnerable cells. So the question is, isn't the safety just literally that you enhance a quick activation induced cell death uh, through in, uh, engaging them, um, and then of course it's safe you engage them, but you don't get the needed proliferation you need in the cell types to really have an effective bispecific engager. Um, that, that's why we turned it around and said we, we, we really like the target, although um, uh, some things need to be solved. Um, and, uh, and of course, whether we have the window of opportunity, uh, this, this needs to be shown in, in studies. Uh, but, but that's why, why, why I'm sort of hesitant uh, for uh, uh, praising the gamma delta carry, uh, sort of a linkage as the golden bullet, because I think these cells just easily crack um, uh, in vivo. Yeah. Michael, any responses? And, and we have a specific question for you or a set, set of questions regarding the Delta ones. Would they be more suitable for solid tumors? And how are they um, uh, are they sort of amenable to suppressive uh, tumor microenvironments? Do you see them being responsive to IL-10, TGF beta? Do they express PD-1, et cetera? More suitable compared to what? So <laughs> yeah. I mean, we clearly focus on delta ones because we think that this 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 tissue biology that these cells bring, and uh, we clearly see that these cells, when they are in tissues, receive survival signals, and and they they function in uh, let's say in environments where other effector cells are, are not so happy anymore. Yeah, so they definitely seem to be adapted. Uh, to function in tissues and 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 uh, they maintain this capability when when you uh, to home into tissues and and I think this is for us a big opportunity right and I'm, I'm definitely excited about having an effector cell that just discriminates normal 
from the Nicklin cells, right? So we don't see any activity on normal cells. And I don't think that this is because these cells are fragile. Uh, they just don't, uh, they clearly discriminate. And then what I've shown earlier is if we can, if we can maintain this even by introducing CAR and then optimizing these constructs uh, to the gamma delta biology, then I think um, there is a big potential to, to revisit the target space for solid tumors. Thank you. Um, can I ask, uh, um, or maybe relay uh, one question to Hans uh, on his talk? Um, and, and this also relates to what was described for the uh, other uh, approaches. Um, do you believe that the uh, drop in abundance of gamma delta T cells in your primate studies is actually due to egress, due to activation? Have you, do you have any sense that that's sort of a general mechanism of action? Um, well, uh, I think the data that, uh, that Daniel showed um, of simultaneous reduction in, in circulation and an apparent increase in the tumor bed uh, are suggestive of in, indeed homing uh, to, to the tumor microenvironment and extravasation. Uh, in, in our non-human primate study, we, we see the extravasation or we see a downregulation at least of, of numbers uh, in circulation. And this is, is likely um, uh, extravasation potentially uh, to some extent in combination with, uh, with uh, lowering of the signal uh, due to T-cell receptor downregulation after activation. But um, in, in our non-human primate study, of course, in the absence of tumor, we see recovery of the gamma delta T-cell population uh, within a few days. So there, the, uh, the, the, uh, the reduction does not persist. But overall, I think these cells have a, are known to have a great uh, tumor homing potential um, in the set of chemokine receptors that uh, makes them move to, to uh, sites of inflammation, including the tumor microenvironment. Can I uh, um, uh, just go back to one thing that's been me is, um, how important do you think there is, is, is the fact that there may or may not be a, a, a presence of gamma delta cells already in a tumor that you, before you start treating? In other words, is it the resident gamma deltas that play an important role, or can we also expect a very important role from the circulating cells actually being induced to, uh, to infiltrate? Maybe, Daniel, what do you think? Uh, the information we have so far are limited because out of 32 patients that we roll with different doses, uh, we have a few blocks uh, perfectly embedded that we could um, investigate and among them very few was immune desert. So I gave an example of immune desert uh, before and after uh, uh, what we have seen, but again, there's no statistics because it's a phase one and a very limited number. Uh, before nothing, no gamma delta, no CD8, and after the K. Uh, so it's the only thing I can say uh, whether it's something that will be relevant is a gastric cancer. It was a gastric cancer, the one I showed. It will be relevant in, in uh, plenty of different tumors that are this immune desert. We'll see. The expansion phase will answer to this. Uh, so it's how uh, clinical studies are moving. You need to have uh, important studies to really have statistics and to, to answer and conclude uh, uh, on, on your question. But it's a way, it's, a, it's one way that I was surprised because initially I would have guessed that the, the BTN3 activating antibody would have worked mainly when gamma delta were present, but it seems that there are, there are two types of responses. One is the exit towards the tumor mm -hmm. and the one might be inside, we'll see. Yeah. Fair enough. Maybe um, ask, uh, uh, can I ask uh, Jim and, and Pam, um, could you both uh, give us your sense of what the major challenges are going forward for this kind of therapy, engaging gamma delta cells either with T cell engages or as, as cell therapy or, or using the butyrophilin specific antibodies? And, 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 and how do you see, what, what, what should we overcome to do this challenge? 
I think the biggest challenge is going to be actually getting some clinical data that corroborates what you're seeing in your in vitro models and your preclinical models, right? So I think the preclinical models are very strong and the data looks great. Um, but I think, again, what, what you see in those models, you know, uh, obviously you're putting in all of the cells in the right concentrations and everything like that. You need to know whether or not those cells will traffic, whether or not they will accumulate and survive um, and expand, um, and as well as allow for the effector mechanisms to have um, a prolonged period of time before you see an immunosuppressive mechanism that will arise to control the response. Because you know that the immune response has that intrinsic yin and yang to it. It's not going to be driven in one direction without having some kind of inhibitory signals to control it. So what is the inhibitory signal that will control a gamma delta uh, T cell response? I don't know what that is. And um, I think we have to try and understand what that is. And also what are the unique patient selection criteria that you're going to use? Because a lot of times we say we're going to treat patients with metastatic disease, but does that mean metastatic disease to the liver, to bones, to the lungs? Because these all have their own specific niches that require different treatment strategies to target the specific microenvironments. And, and so those are all the things I think, you know, still have to be addressed. And again, I think, you know, the clinical data will speak for itself. Jim? I would just add, I mean, I agree with what Pam said. I think one of those things that you don't really know yet, just because of the lack of experience, is, is this, this special property where they, the cells seem to have this inherent ability to recognize, you know, cancer, whatever that signal is, and, and how broad, how broadly spread is that with different kinds of tumors. And, and as Pam was saying, you know, T cells behave different ways in different niches. Um, you know, can can you expect this to work in in, in bone marrow? I mean, in, in bone metastasis, for example, which is a very difficult situation for, for alpha beta T cells. Um, Great. It's going to be known until you try it. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I think there were uh, one or two questions about um, the importance of cell number and, and and how do we look at manufacturing of cell therapies. I think. Michael and, uh, and also you, you gave uh, at least a, a large portion of the answer already in your talk, but would you care to comment on what you expect is going to be uh, if, if we do adopt a cell transfer, what the cell number needs to be, what the range of cell numbers is and, and how you think about manufacturing that also since you're thinking about allogeneic uh, settings? So for solid tumor specifically, I think when, when, you, when you currently see uh, clinical data, I think you, you, you need to think about doses up to above a billion, five to 10 billion. I think this is when, when you look at the clinical data from alpha beta T cells, the TCR, autologous alpha beta T cells. I think this, this is a dose range uh, uh, that you need to aim for. Um, I mean, the big challenge is our platform is allogenate. If you want to, if you want to see responses in solid tumors, uh, we don't know how long these cells persist, right? So this this will be the big challenge, and, and we obviously think about strategies to to overcome immediate rejection of these cells uh, to have a prolonged uh, or uh, more durable response. But, but I think this is for every allogeneic approach one of the biggest hurdles to overcome rejection. And, and have these cells stay around for long enough that they actually uh, can induce a response. Yeah. So that's, that's the biggest challenge. Okay. I think we're almost, uh, we're getting to the end of this session. Uh, what I wanted to do is ask um, Jim and Pam for some last uh, thoughts about this field and then how they hope uh, this progresses. Jim, you're on mute. I was just going to say that I think that the, 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 the growth of the understanding of biology has been huge from the presentations today. I'm really impressed. I learned a, a lot about it, but I think that, um, you know, there is a way, there's quite a ways to go on, on really, really getting a grasp on, on some of the mechanistic 
underpinnings of, of some of the observations that have been made. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, with alpha beta cells, for example, it's been shown accidentally in some cases, but that you don't really necessarily have to give such large numbers of cells because they, you know, they can expand. But allogeneic is obviously a different situation. And, and, uh, and down-regulatory mechanisms, as Pam said, may, may pop up. Um, so I think uh, it's off to a wonderful start and just needs to, you know, be carefully on these different aspects and facets. So the biologists need to be continually, you know, sorted out and unraveled. Pam? So I'll just add that, you know, I think there's always been interest in how to harness the power of gamma delta T cells. I mean, I think that interest was there, you know, for a long time. It's whether how we can deliver on that. And maybe part of delivering on it has to do about the era that we're in, right? I think take advantage of the era that we're currently in with immune checkpoint therapies, because I do think combination therapies are the future. I don't think anyone needs to start thinking about their specific agent as a monotherapy. I mean, we shouldn't be thinking that way anymore. I mean, it's, it's great to say that we're all going to have the next cure to cancer, but let's be realistic that it's probably not a monotherapy that's going to do that, that we really need to come up with the right combination strategy. So you're in an era right now where combination strategies are quickly coming up and being tested in preclinical models. And what, where do you partner and what are the mechanisms that you want to partner with for gamma delta T cells to have their greatest impact, I think is something that, you know, needs to be considered. So I, I love the data seeing that, you know, there's already um, partnership with an anti-PD-1 antibody, for example. And, you know, I would just say that's something to be considered. What else can we take advantage of? Because you're seeing TIGIT, OX40, all of these other um, agents that are out there. And, you know, I, I'm, I don't know. And I think the data still, you know, needs to be, um, figured out, but what are the right combinations? And, you know, maybe it's even triplets, not just two agents. So I'm sure that we're going to have gamma delta T cells come to the forefront as effective therapy. Um, and I'm sure that the biology will guide us towards the appropriate combination strategies. Well, thank you both uh, very, very much for uh, helping to, uh, to run a, a great um, uh, panel discussion here. Thanks to all the speakers too. I'm, I'm going to project a couple of slides now to sort of wrap up the session.